Good afternoon, everybody. This is one of our regular seminars, and uh, we are uh, linked globally uh, because there are others uh, in Africa as well as other parts of the world who are interested in, in our seminar series. And in this case, I'm sure it draws attention on our current work on climate change. So this afternoon, we have the pleasure of having Bob Parkinson, uh, who is a um, senior lect lecturer at the University of Melbourne. He actually is an economist. I've known him for, if we count the 80s, for more than 20 years. Uh, we met in a um, research station on livestock, right? A livestock research station when we were visiting around Australia, and that will tell you our interest in livestock, even in the 80s. So Bob is uh, for, with the Department for Agriculture and Food Systems uh, of the Melbourne School of Land and Environment. And he's been there for about six years or seven years, yeah, since 19, oh, 2007, 2008. Uh, but initially, uh, he's been, and that's where I met him, uh, in the UNE Armidale area, uh, University of New England in Armidale and uh, moved to Tamworth before going to the University of Melbourne. Um, there is a good connection between um, Bob Parkinson and the work, uh, the team work that we're doing, especially in the future, as we have, uh, we are expecting that we very, will have a very good collaboration and continuing one uh, with, the research, uh, with the research program on markets, institutions, and policies through our uh, work on impacts assessments. Uh, and research priority setting, and uh, maybe some connections to the climate change work that he's been doing, uh, looking at adaptation strategies and maybe the le levels of resilience, which some of our team that I called upon uh, have been engaged in in the last three years. So I'd like to inter I would like to invite Bob uh, to share some of his main findings and results um, on this project and adaptation to climate change to dryland farming systems. And a um, short walk this morning just gave me some advanced information that is very much relevant to the work that we have here, not only because of climate change, but looking at the perennials, that crop, perennial crops that he has been looking at uh, in the past several years. Bob? Thank you, Cynthia, for that introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here today to uh, to present to uh, to you here at CIMIT about uh, some work that uh, was completed uh, a couple of or oh, last year about perenniality as an adaptation to climate change in dryland farming systems. And part of uh, that research team was is Ramalan, or was Ramalan, and he's now here, so uh, he can be uh, a co author of the um, presentation today. And this is the full title and author group of uh, the project, uh, a Perenniality as an Adaptation uh, to Climate Change in Dryland Farming Systems. And we had, I think, 10 or 11 people there. We had some economists and some climate uh, modelers and some plant, plant modelers and so, um, uh, it was quite a multidisciplinary uh, activity and quite a multi-institutional activity as well. As background, in fact, uh, for the last few years, I've been employed partly by this Future Farm Industries Cooperative Research Centre. So the CRC model is something that the Australian government has um, used for research and development. And uh, this particular CRC was uh, located in, in Perth in Western Australia, but partners throughout Australia and uh, multiple disciplines. And, and their focus was on perennial plants as an adaptation to farming systems issues in Australia and in particularly dryland salinity. So in Western Australia, we have a large area that was cleared of uh, bush and scrub, and now it is, um, it is used for extensive cropping and, and, and pasture. And with that clearing, the 
the deep roots that kept the, uh, the soil water profile well down, they were removed and the soil profile, soil water has risen and there were existing salts in the, in the farming profile, in the soil profile that had um, been deposited over the millennia. And those salts that were already there were raised up with the water into the root zone and hence a salinity problem, dryland salinity we called it. And so this project that I now want to talk about is was funded jointly by the Future Farm Ministry CRC and NCAR, this, this cl climate change adaptation research facility. And we had that large, fairly large group, but it was only for 12 months and we had to really uh, run hard to get it done. But it was a good way to build on previous work from the Cooperative Research Centre because it had been looking at systems or technologies about uh, adaptation with perennials. Perennial, it, it's, its catch cry or is it, its uh, trademark is profitable perennials. That's what the CRC is all about. And this project was, and it had been doing work probably in a historic context, and this uh, project allowed us to uh, consider climate change, so perenniality in a, in a changed climate system, and to conduct an economic analysis of that. So um, that was a good thing from their point of view. Now, adaptation with perennials. We were interested in these adaptation responses. It was an opportunity to draw together this R&D on perennial plants and mallees, and I'll, I'll explain them in a minute, uh, to conduct a farming systems analysis, to look at different types of climates, to conduct some economic, whole farm economic analyses. And this, this idea of perennials is that the... the the deeper rooting systems uh, will lower the soil moisture levels. And so if, if those trees, those perennials with the deeper roots have been removed in the past to allow us to grow crops like that, then the, then the, uh, the soil moisture comes up with the salt. If we plant perennials again, they will not only take that soil moisture, um, soil level down, but also if we have a a changed climate where we have a drier climate and uh, a hotter climate, then plants with access to soil moisture at lower levels may be able to survive better and, and to be part of a, you know, a, a, a system that can still function in, under a climate change. So that's the idea of perenniality, and it's a pretty broad concept, really. And so NCARF were interested in adaptation responses, so it's National Climate Change Adaptation Research Facility, and and they asked us the question about financial viability, adaptation to maintain financial viability. Uh, we weren't focused on other types of responses or or impacts such as environmental. We didn't really have time to do that, um, but we we looked at um, a predicted climate change uh, to 2030 dry, and we compared it to the historic record. That's what we did basically. Now when we look at what does adaptation mean, the IPCC talks about adaptation, adjustment in natural and human systems in response to actual or expected climate stimuli or their effects and that, that adjustment moderates harm and exploits beneficial opportunities. So uh, some key words, adjustment in systems, response to expected climate stimuli and exploit beneficial opportunities. So that that IPCC definition was quite uh, relevant and, and we, we sort of focused on that in, in what we did. There was also this issue of transformational change. So I guess a lot of people in society, maybe in Australian society, are worried about agriculture in a, in a, in a climate changed world and, and do we need to transform agriculture and, and what does that mean? So we had to think about transformational change, uh, or we certainly they, they were keen to talk to us about that in developing this project. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. So what did we do? We used representative farms or models that, that are representative of farming systems and we conducted analysis. So it might be, it might be a case study, but we, we hope that if we use a representative farm and we study it in some detail, we might draw some information which might be of general interest to that system and uh, over some sort of a region. And, and I guess there's an assumption that there's some sort of homogeneity in, 
in the farms in that region so that we can do this type analysis with some, some potentially beneficial information. We used plant simulation models to predict likely plant responses. So if we have a drier and warmer climate, climate and also an in, in, increase in CO2, then what does that do for plant responses that might be capable of being produced on, on the farm? So we, we certainly need to look at, at plant responses. Uh, and we used APSIM, and I'll talk about the models in a minute. But we did adjust, so we used those models and we adjusted the yields that they might predict down for this, this question of what might be uh, capable of being produced on a research station and when, when everything's done very well and what might be actual possible on a farm. So, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a reference there from quite a long time ago about a couple of economists who looked at that question. And so we tested these plant responses in our whole farm systems models and, and as I said, because they were interested in the financial viability the so-called beneficial opportunities were interpreted as farm income change. We also tried to conduct a bit of a risk analysis of, of, of that income. And I want to give first the main findings. And so we studied four farming systems in different places and we concluded from our analysis that adaptation to predicted climate change with perenniality, perennial plants and pastures and, and mallees, was technically possible and economically advantageous. So that was that was a that was a con conclusion from the work, and and in policy terms, if governments are worried about this question of whether agriculture can adapt to a climate changed world autonomously or by itself, then these sorts of results seem to suggest that that was possible. At least for these particular cases uh, that we studied, but we also called for, uh, all good researchers call for more research, don't they? So we called for more agricultural adaptation R&D, and you guys are doing that here too. So where did we, where did we uh, study? We, we actually had some existing farming system models for locations, and so we, we didn't have time to develop new models for locations, so we, we actually proposed and they agreed to fund work for these locations. Two in Western Australia, one in New South Wales, and one in Victoria. Cunderdon, Katanning in Western Australia, Wagga, Wagga in New South Wales, and Hamilton in Victoria. This was our experimental design or scenarios. So we look on the left hand side, we can see a couple of alternative climates. We looked at what happens now, what might we experience now and what might be experienced in the future. And then this perenniality, with and without perenniality in, in, in those cases. So that was our experimental design that we hoped would um, be uh, sort of robust and interesting and valuable in terms of the type of analysis and the results that we might generate. Mallee trees in alley systems. So a mallee or a eucalyptus, a eucalypt tree uh, you can see there's uh, on the right, those are mallees that have been planted. I don't know how long they might have been growing for a few years, three or four or five years. And on the left, we see a crop of wheat. And so those are mallee trees, but they've been grown in an agricultural landscape. And we call them in an alley system. So the general context in Australia is for much broad scale farming, much bigger than we see, than I've seen in the last few days here in India and, and lots of other places too. So <clears throat> we have two rows of trees, those mallees, and then we have another 100 metres or so of, of field, paddock, and another row of trees. And so that enables our broad scale farming to continue. <clears throat> so in Australia, large scale equipment, very broad um, uh, and efficiencies from economies of scale. <coughs> so the benefits from trees could be things like shelter from livestock or, or erosion uh, reduced, as well as the benefit from harvesting the trees. Uh, there are some costs involved. We, we actually lose productive land for, in an agricultural sense to grow the trees, but they might be productive themselves. And there's also this competition zone <coughs> at the level because the trees might be taking some moisture and nutrients from at least 
the pastoral crop close by. So there's this competition zone issue, which one of our um, one of our authors looked at that in quite some detail. And the mallee trees are for biomass. So the above ground matter is completely harvested <coughs> and it's part of the, the R&D we a specialised harvester was developed. This is a new industry, so in a sense tra if we think about transformational change then, then this is maybe what people mean, a new industry but we need, it would need, it's, it's, it's biofuels, biomass, it's processed for power, for, for, for local uh, uses, regional uses, or it could be for aviation fuel, fuel. And so if you have a regional processing facility, you need to have a catchment area around with enough trees to be able to maintain throughput and keep that economic to run in terms of cost. So some analyses have been done in terms of the requirements for that as well. But in general, this is, a, this is not really an industry that's already developed. Uh, there's still a lot of work being done and in fact uh, the CRC is, at, um, is negotiating with um, the aviation industry about whether, whether fuel could be developed and used from biofuels. <coughs> but there has been substantial R&D conducted and I guess this is this issue, is this transformational change? Is it a new land use, a new market and a new type of processing? Maybe it is transformational in that sense. So there's a picture of the the harvester that, or, and this may be about second generation, I think. So as there's no use researchers doing research and about trees unless you can cut them down <clears throat> and process them. And so they did, they have developed the harvester, and uh, and that's very important. And there's a picture of maybe an alley farming system. We can see the trees on the left and the right, and a crop of wheat growing in the middle. The perennial pasture plants that we considered varied according to region and and in Western Australia, um, tedera, which is bituminaria bituminosa. Um, it's a herbaceous deep-rooted perennial legume that has been used by farmers in the Canary Islands for, for a long time. And so part of the CRC was plant introduction, plant testing, uh, whether the plant survives, and then plant testing in terms of productivity. And so... Tetera was, was one that looked to be pretty good and came up well in that process. So there's a picture of some um, of a tetera plant and some um, as it might be planted. Uh, other plants were also submitted uh, considered as well. So here's our modelling, our approach, if you like. <coughs> we um, Apart from scoping and conceptualising the project, the first thing we did was go and speak to farmer groups and consultants and advisors and researchers <coughs> at each of the four locations. We had climate data downscaled. They were used, that was used in plant models <coughs> to predict uh, plant responses. That went into a whole farm economic model and also into a, a paddock level um, financial model and information from both those came out to results. So that's the, the process that we used and um, it was quite a hectic <clears throat> 12 months to get all that done. Here's a picture of Ramalan at Wagga. Just to show that he did actually do something in the project and uh, that was that the guy and, and Amir. This is Amir who uh, one of my, he was the co-project leader, project co-leader with me and this is a fellow who uh, works for New South Wales DPI as uh, an advisory officer, but he also uh, runs his own farm. <laughs> uh, he was very talk to, uh, good to talk to. And I also went to Cunderdon. So, um, and what did those farmers say to us? They are already adapting to historic climate variability. Okay, the Australian is a dry, dry land farming. We don't have any um, tube wells to bring up and supplement our, our dry land systems. We do have irrigation in Australia, but dryland farming systems are completely reliant on rainfall. And they were confident that they could continue or could respond to climate change, at least in the short term. We asked them about their objectives and they said they are primarily economic. 
which suited us because we're economists, um, <laughs> but they were looking for new technologies to help them in, uh, in the future. And this Mallys for Biomass, we asked them, I said, what would you think about a new type of enterprise or activity on the farm? And, and they weren't generally averse to that, and some of them said, show me the money, you know, how much is, is it going to be beneficial? So that was, that was good to get that sort of uh, idea in our mind at the start. On the climate data, we, um, we considered two uh, climate series, a historic and a future. So it was 2030 dry, but we, we actually looked, we got climate series from 2012 to 2052, 40 years into the future, 40 years in the past. We, the silo historic data we, we down, was available, patch point data, and uh, Daily Liu and Anwar from New South Wales DPI at Wagga um, downloaded climate data from eight, 18 global climate models with, for a particular emission scenario, and they, they downscaled that, did some bias correction, and um, they were experts in these things. And we chose one uh, GCM to compare with the silo. We couldn't do 18 comparisons, just not possible. <clears throat> so there's, we, we actually analysed one in comparison with historic. And we conducted statistical tests of differences between those series in terms of the mean and the, the variance. What were the particular climate variables? We were going into APSIM and grass grow, so we wanted daily minimum and maximum temperatures. We wanted daily precipitation. And, and we, we assumed a CO2 level change and that was put into those models as well. Uh, so we can see that the predictions are for a, an increase in temperature, decrease in rainfall and an increase in CO2. And of course, in a plant growth sense, some of those things might be uh, contradictory or have different effects. So that's why we use the models. <coughs> Here are some of the climate results for one location at Cundinan for daily minimum temperature. So we have here, uh, each of these is, is 40 years in a box and whiskers plot, and we just plotted them first. And so the, the historic is the one that's labelled silo there. And then the 18 GCMs, are put in, um, those series are put in as well. And, and so we, we've ordered, ranked those in order of increasing mean. And you can see that uh, most of the predictions are for a higher temperature, but we don't, maybe not that, that much. But, uh, and the, the S2 is this series here. Okay, so we chose to compare this with that in our particular analysis. Monthly mean minimum temperature, distributions of temperature of minimum temperature by day, this is, but we plotted it, calculated and plotted it by lunch, by month, <laughs> by month, and the historic is the purple and the white boxes are the future. So we can see how the change in distribution might be predicted from comparing that historic series with the, the S2 future series. And so we can see that there are some substantial changes in, in levels there and in distributions as well. So generally a higher a higher temperature, mean minimum temperature, uh, and sometimes the distributions change a little bit as well. Monthly rainfall distributions compared as well. So again, the historic is the purple and the future is the white boxes and boxing whiskers. So we can see um, there, those are the sort of data that were going into our, our plant prediction models. So we used APSIM for crops, we used grass grow for pastures, and we had those two 40 years of historic and 40 years of future. And we had four sites, and we had different soil types at each location. So here's one particular distribution. This is for wheat at Cunderdon. And so we have, uh, again, the historic is in the purple and the future is in the white. And it's for three soil types across the top. And so we can see that we're predicting the yield, the mean yield to go down and there's some changes in distributions there.
At Katanning, um, available herbage, total available herbage kilograms per hectare per day on the y-axis, annual pasture versus perennial pasture, and then on the right-hand side we have these are different soil types, land management units. And again, the historic is in the purple and the future is in the green in this case. So we can see that for the perennial pastures there are some change, and again by month, but there are some predicted in improvements at Katanning in perennial pastures under under a future versus a historic. So that's what that's what the predictions told us, and that's what we used as inputs. So, um, um, and in fact, at Katanning, that farming system is predominantly pastures producing um, wool and meat. And so in this case, the historic, uh, there appeared to be a bit of an advantage. And we think that might be, maybe it's a change in seasonality. Sometimes these, these distributions are shifting a little bit east-west, if you like. <coughs> we also uh, predicted mallee growth. So this is growing the trees. Uh, so you, you plant them and six years late, you, later you, you cut them off at ground level and mulch all that stuff and take it away. Then you let them grow again for four years, cut them, grow and forth. So that's coppicing, if you like. And uh, we predicted above ground with the green and below ground biomass with the orange. So we did plant predictions for, for uh, Mali as well. What did we uh, use in terms of economic methodology? We used a whole farm economic models. MIDAS is a model of integrated dryland agricultural systems. So it's and it's been developed in West Australia by uh, Kingwall and Panel and those guys, and they've, they've they've actually had a long history of of developing the models in discussion with, discussing with um, with uh, scientists and extension officers and adapting and developing the models, and they are linear programming models. So they're optimising constrained optimisation models. So we've got an objective function of profits. We have different activities that can be selected optimally to maximise profits but those activities use resources of land, labour and capital uh, and, uh, and, 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 and these models, um, the land constraint, they had a few LMUs as I showed you there a minute ago, land management units. We had, I think there's eight in the Cunderdon model and then there's, there's labour periods um, and there's plant growth periods as well. Quite a big and detailed model. Constrained optimisation. And so we had these different types of constraints and then the activities are actually rotations. So we, we might have a rotation which is joined together to give a dollar per hectare and it con contributes to the objective function but there are constraints about how those things can, can relate to one another <coughs> and enter, the, uh, enter the, uh, the, uh, the optimal solution. The pasture growth periods were distinguished, as I said, capital and labour constraints and they are representative of farming systems. And they are economic models in if, if you have an economic objective and you've got a constraint, then they are constrained optimisation and the, and the choice of what, what activity is optimally selected depends on how much they contribute to the objective function, so that marginal value product. And these can address land use changes, uh, as I will illustrate in a little more. We did also financial analysis with another a model called Imagine, which is Amir Abadi, my co-author and the guy in that photo, uh, he developed this. It's a paddock or a field level mold model. It's multi-period. It's just for a paddock or a couple of paddocks. It's not a whole farm. It's not optimisation. Um, but it can incorporate in quite some detail the biophysical relationships, <coughs> climatic variability. We can put prices, price variability in there as well. And so we develop cash flow variability and we can compare technologies or systems in that sense as well. And in fact, this Imagine model, Amir did quite a lot of work about that competition zone and how much, how, 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 how big is the competition zone and does it have much of an effect on, on crop yield. So here is, here is um, only one location, Cunderdon. Here are some results which I can uh, use to illustrate the type of findings that we, we had. So on the, here we have, here's my experimental design. I'm presenting the historic climate and the base system. 
and then the future climate and some options. Across here, because it's, it's a 2,000 hectare model, so that's the land that's available and gets used, but if there's a change in optimal farm mix, we can see, we can get some idea of how that land use change might occur and how much it might occur and what it might consist of. And then we, we can express our farm profit in terms of dollars per hectare. So in the, in the base case, this is the historic climate with historic plant parameters, and we, we have an 83% crop and a 17% pasture, and that actually accords pretty well with what benchmarking data that we have for this region tells us. And a certain level of farm income, if we, if we, if we look at a, another, or if we include the activities um, with the climate change parameters from our plant models, and we solve that model, we still get the same same farm area mix, but we lose about twenty dollars worth of farm profit. So that's if 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 climate change happens and it affects plant growth and we don't do anything about it, then we could have up to twenty percent or so reduction in farm profit. If we then put perennial pasture activities, the new activities if you like, in, then we get <clears throat> a change in land use mix, we, we see there's quite a bit of reduction in crop, annual pasture is relatively unchanged but lucerne and tetera come in and our farm income comes back, yeah. comes back to what it was before and it's an improvement over, this is the real counterfactual of what would happen with climate change without any adaptation if you like. And then when we add Mali in it gives a little bit more to our objective function. The Mali can only ever be about 6% of the farm area because that's, it's just those two rows, if you like. So that's, that's the type of results that our whole farm economic models give us, and that's the basis of saying something about adaptation with an economic objective. And then if we use our cash flow model and look at, at cash flow, so here's time across the, model, the bottom and this is dollars per hectare of cash. The, the, the purple one is, is historic, the black and white dashed is the future and we calculate, we can calculate from these the annual equivalent value. So the equivalent value of annually of, of a varying series over time and we can see that the uh, $117 per hectare down to 95. So and we can look at the pattern, we can also do CV or whatever else we want to do about variability. So that's, that's a wheat, barley, canola rotation on a particular soil type at Cunnerton. So that's the sort of analysis that we could do with, in a cash flow sense. And so what, what can we say about the whole farm results? They varied regionally. In each location, adding perenniality was economically beneficial. At two locations, climate change without adaptation reduced farm profit. At one location, there was an improved farm economic outcome under, outcome under a changed climate because the perennial pasture seemed to uh, have some sort of benefit with the changed seasonality under a changed climate. Mallee biomass was profitable. We had to assume a, a price. And at those two locations where... Um, where the economic outcome was reduced under climate change by adding perenniality, it brought them back up, if you like, in terms of profit. That's where the report is available. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. And then you've got all your, all your um, wheat and 
What's the concept behind that? Because I'd like to understand that. Try uh, in this being the um, driver of the adaptation strategy. What is what is it that is doing is perennials do to the wheat uh, to make it uh, the the whole farm more profitable because of that adaptation? Well, it'll, the idea behind the alley system is that we can grow grow trees and we can harvest them and get some income from them, but we can also continue to have either crops or pastures in and continue to have our large-scale agriculture. If we do our big spraying and planting and harvesting <coughs> options, then we've still got space to do that. And so I guess I guess the question, the answer could be that um, the value of 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 mallees will vary according to price. It could be in we wanted to put them in as an option and see whether they were whether they were profitable, and 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 the work that was done in developing biofuel concept. Uh, ask me that. I think that the idea is that you have an integrated system or integrated in a general landscape sense. And you still have the options to produce from both systems. The climate change component is the fact that they are deeper rooting, the perenniality. Well, you can, yes, through um, you have if you have an apsim with a apsim has a soil component and a plant component, and if you have a, a saline component or a saline um, saline situation, then then apsim can do that, and um, I'm not sure whether we in our in our APSIM modelling actually looked at, at soil water depth. We mainly we mainly looked at the, the impact of changing temperature and rainfall and CO two on plant plant responses. <laughs> On different parts of the landscape, okay. And if, if there's a little bit of uh, competition, then we try to account for the, that impact on yield as well. <coughs> Thanks. Yeah, Bob. Uh, there are many studies and uh, agrobiological scientists that this perennial. Whether it is uh, grasses or trees, but when we do the financial analysis, or economic analysis, to prove whether it is beneficial for the farmers or not, then since we have a long-term context of the annual trend, and today there is something market price of that particular tree or grasses, as you mentioned, that twenty-four dollars per ton. But when we talk to farmer, Farmer doesn't know what happened after 10 years or 5 years. So it is very difficult to convince the farmer because we are also not sure the price will remain the same. So how do you take care of that when we policy? So there's two, two things I could say there. One is that the, those, the comparison of the whole farm system and economics with and without perenniality under a climate change is... Two equilibriums, if you like. We're not 
this model doesn't look at the process of getting from one to another. Okay, so that's not the purpose of the model. And so I don't think you can have a model that does answers absolutely every, every question. So we're, we're looking at if, if we had perenniality and we moved to climate change, um, would that be an, a help? The other question, the other part of the answer is this issue, and, and in fact my discussions with people in the last couple of days have said that, and particularly for smallholders who are poor and who don't have a lot of financial resources, the discount rate's pretty high. They're not really, can't conceive or, or even think about benefits five or ten years in hence. So, so that's very difficult to try and convince in a concept uh, or a, a question of change, short-term cost for a long-term benefit. It's very difficult to convince them you would really need to demonstrate a short-term benefit as well. And, and then you'd, and there is the risk that the price might go down as well. So it's, it's difficult to, um, and, and maybe this sort of, well, I'm not sure whether you do research on biofuels here as an option, but maybe it is a difficult thing to try and sell in, in the context of many of the farming systems you know, you're trying to study. There is a question. Uh, from Sudha Gumadi, are the projected changes in surface temperatures within the optimum range of the crops? Are the projected changes in surface temperatures within the optimum range for the crops? You've got to go? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Right. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Can I, I'll, I'll just answer this question. And so the the question is the projected change in temperatures within the optimum range of the crops. Now, I'm I'm not a crop modeler. I didn't run Apsim, so um, I would say that when we use models, we set them up, calibrate, and validate them for predictions and, and situations and circumstances that we know and then if we're confident about that then we try and predict them into uh, circumstances that we don't know. And so I'm not sure what the optimum range for those crops is but, but when, we, when we ran APSIM the predicted yields in a changed climate were lower than before. So if they're going outside the optimum range then we're seeing that in a yield reduction, and we saw that. And those were the results that came into our, into our analysis. So I hope that's answered the question. There's another question here. On what basis did we choose uh, the global climate model to compare with the historic? And um, we chose that's the uh, the the S2 is the CSIRO Mark 3.5. And it had been used by researchers in Australia on a number of times to look at climate change issues. And our experts within the, the group recommended that we use that. So it's nothing, it's nothing more than that as the basis. So I hope that's answered the question here. Um, but but we, we chose it based on advice from, from the experts within our group. Okay, so the, que uh, the question is about the perennial benefits in the current climate. We did actually generate some of those results, but didn't pre pre present those. But I think the question that NCARF wanted us to answer was about what happens if climate change happens. And, and, and the relevant comparison is 
if climate change happens and we don't have perennially versus climate change happens if we do have perennially but there is there is an additional question which you've outlined which is are we better off to you know, try and include some perenniality in our current systems and I'm sure um, you're doing a lot of work in that that sort of area but but we did actually look at that but I didn't I didn't present the results because I wanted to mainly focus on uh, the future the ones in the Western Australia would have Uh, as, I, I, as I said, we can't do everything with models, and, and in fact, we, we, in terms of plant responses, we focused on the impact of temperature, rainfall, and CO2, and we didn't really focus on on groundwater changes. Okay, that's, it was just too much to do in a short time frame. But that's an interesting and, and good question, which I can't answer. So the question is, uh, why alley systems, 100 metres, and what's the biology underlying that? We could plant malleys for biomass wall to wall, but I think that the farmers in Australia are, would not go for that. They would be more interested in an alley type system. So it may be more an economic reason than a biology reason why that, that and, and, and there's quite a bit of research has been done within the CRC which I haven't been involved in but Amir has, one of my co-authors, and, and that's the system that they've, they've talked to farmers, in fact some farmers are even growing malleys in alley systems already and I think that's the system that they've come up with, which is probably most appealing or likely to be um, um, accepted by farmers. And so um, the economic returns from malleys versus crops and pastures will vary depend on, depending on prices and that sort of thing. Uh, but, but I think in the in the choice of system that uh, it's more a question of what might be acceptable and feasible in a, in a farming systems context. I think that's the answer to your question. Thank you. Yes, I've I've enjoyed coming here and getting some new questions. That's been wonderful.